Hello. Hello. Welcome to Broken Shark. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me. It's my honour. Um, so I wanted to start by you telling us about how you got started as a film director or as a director. It took me a stupid amount of time to get anywhere. It took me like 12 years before I got anywhere near directing. I did every kind of job. Um, you know, as a runner, location manager, a assistant director, a producer, anything just to kind of get on set and learn. Um, but it's um, it's a very hard thing to become a director because there's no there's no route. I did every kind of job. Um, you know, as a runner, location manager, a assistant director, a producer, anything just to kind of get on set and learn. Um, but it's um, it's a very hard thing to become a director because there's no there's no route. I'm so old that when I left university and kind of got into the business, there was very little going on. And what was going on was Ridley Scott, Hugh Hudson, Alan Parker, who were commercials directors, and they were kind of beginning to move into film. They were making their first films when I first started. And so it seemed that that was a good way of getting in. So I joined various commercials companies. And eventually, out of that, I started directing commercials. But I was really crap at it. I really was. I was no good at commercials. I'm just not flash enough. And, you know, someone once said to me that, that the purpose of a director is to get the, um, the agency fired from the account. You should do something that's so weird and so different and so odd that the client hates it. And um, clients always love my work. They go, oh, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, just what we thought. Um, and it was soul destroying stuff, not because I don't mind making ads, I don't mind selling things, you know, that's, I don't have any moral objection about it. It was just creatively and artistically, um, it left a little bit to be desired. I once made um, a bunch of commercials for um, Rennie indigestion tablets and I got a letter from the managing director uh, saying that in 30 years of making Rennie indigestion commercials, I'd got the best performance of indigestion they'd ever seen. And that was kind of, that was the creative high point of my commercials career. So it really wasn't for me. And um, I finally got out of it and got into drama by badgering a producer I vaguely knew and talking her into letting me direct one episode of Peak Practice, a corny old TV show about doctors. Um, and out of that, I got um, two episodes of Cold Feet in the first series. Doing Cold Feet, was it at the time, because obviously it became massively popular, were you aware of that at the time, or did it feel scary? Cold Feet was my big break, and I knew it. You know, I kind of, I could tell it was cool, you know what I mean? Peak Practice, good though it is, was a kind of cheesy old series for middle-aged people, but Cold Feet, there was something new and different and kind of younger about it. I was desperate to do a good job, you know, you could, you could feel that this was something that I'd been given something I could really make something out of that could be really quite special. And if it wasn't special, I would have fucked up and that would be it. I remember the DP pulling me aside on the second day and said, try and look as if you're enjoying it. Because I think I was so nervous and so kind of desperate to do a good job that I was like kind of, it was all kind of a bit desperate. Bizarrely, it was perfect for me. And it kind of, everything I've done ever since, there's been a similar balance, mix of comedy and drama. That's my thing. It's that kind of make them laugh, make them cry thing. And Cold Feet was exactly that. So it was bizarre. I hadn't really done anything, and yet the perfect thing found me. And let's talk about, say, Saving Grace and Kind of Goodman. What was it about those scripts in particular that you first respond to and think, I can do this? Or Well, Saving Grace came to me as a TV film. I, th I thought it was for Sky Television. I thought it was going to be for television. And, and I thought, um, that's good. That's a kind of halfway step between television and film. It's a full-length film, but it's for television. I thought, great. Um, it had a similar kind of balance of comedy and drama, so I liked that. And it was also a kind of a hymn to the, the wonders of marijuana, which was something that I could relate to. So it all looked good, really. But... Um, it was an incredibly fraught and difficult production. Um, it nearly collapsed twice in pre-production. And the shoot was very hard because we shot it quickly for no money. And the DP, who's my oldest and dearest friend, John, um, punched the line producer at one point. And um, 
he had to go, not not John, the libraries had to go. Um, there were people in tears every day. It felt like a disaster for a lot of the time. Even during the editing of it, I, I felt like this hasn't quite come off, maybe. I don't know, is this, is this any good? Maybe not. To my surprise, we, we got invited to the Sundance Film Festival. I was so naive, I didn't even know what the Sundance Film Festival was, or where Sundance was, but I said, sure, I'll go. And cut to, I'm in Sundance, um, having lunch with Robert Redford, going, oh, hang on, <laughs> oh, this is the proper job, eh? And um, we won a prize, the Audience Award, and um, we sold the film to New Line for several million dollars, and I was the hit of the festival. And it was a terrible shock. Um, I suddenly realised one day I was a movie director, and I had agents everywhere pursuing me, and... Um, gift baskets would be arriving every half hour in my hotel. And um, I had two agents even pursue me once down a ski slope. Um, and I was, I was so desperate to get away from it all because I felt like I was in over my head. And I went skiing because it's in a ski resort. And um, uh, these two agents were pursuing me down the ski slope going, hey, we love your movie. And I'd be kind of skiing through the forest to try and get them off my tail. It was all like being in a bad James Bond movie. It took years for me to kind of get my head around it because I went to Sundance, a kind of fledgling TV director, and I came back a Hollywood movie director. And it happened in 24 hours. And it happened so fast, I couldn't even kind of get to grips with it. And I ended up effectively going straight to Los Angeles from Sundance. I got involved with Kate Hudson in a romantic comedy and used to hang out at her house with her and Goldie and I was just thinking, oh my God, look at this. I have never felt so successful in all my life. It's the very height of my little bit of fame and success and glory, um, but no one was paying me any money. I hadn't been paid hardly anything for Saving Grace. I was paying for my own hotel and I was slowly and quietly going bankrupt. I mean, like quite seriously bankrupt. And I stayed in the standard hotel in the Hollywood Boulevard for months. And I stayed there because I couldn't afford to move out. If I checked out, I'd have to pay the bill and all my credit cards were maxed out. I had no money. So I kept kind of dodging the manager as I ran through reception in the morning. Um, and he'd go, Mr. Cole, could we talk about your... Oh, he's gone. And... Um, the film never happened. I mean, six months I waited for it and slowly but surely going broke and um, it just wouldn't come together. She we couldn't find a co-star that she liked and the studio liked and scripts weren't quite perfect and, you know, suddenly... And um, in desperation, really, I started to think, well, maybe I need to find something else, you know, another job. And at that moment, my gorgeous and beautiful girlfriend rang up and said, I'm pregnant. I got on a plane home and um, agreed to do Counter Girls, which had been pursuing me, but I'd kind of been holding off because like I'm doing a Hollywood movie. Just because you've worked with so many different types of actors, yeah. Julia Roberts, Rufus Hound, who wasn't, you know, I mean, I just need, just, I'm curious about the excitement of, you know, when someone comes in for a casting and it's sure. so exciting just, you know how that feels and you know not all directors like working with actors from my experience some of them hide from them directors don't always realize that that you know working with actors and working with writers is something that you really need to learn how to do you know and it's no good just having good ideas somehow or other you have to persuade others to achieve them and that's the frustrating thing about being a director is that you don't actually do anything you have to get other people to do it for you and that's not quite as easy as it looks it's just the most exciting thing in the world when you find the perfect actor for the part you've spent maybe two three years trying to imagine what's this person like what do they sound like what do they look like and then one day there they are in front of you and if they're if they're adding to that vision if they're bringing us alive when it's been lying dead and cold on the page, you just kind of, you're just so grateful to them. You go, thank you, you know, look at you, you're bringing this alive. You breathe life into my baby. And um, that's just such a great feeling that I'm always, always incredibly grateful 
acting is something that you can't actually achieve great results by trying harder. You've got to work hard as an actor. They work harder than almost anyone on set. But there are times when just wanting to do it great is not enough. You've somehow got to go and find something and summon up something from inside you or connect with the material in, in some way and put yourself in a place where you're relaxed enough and free enough to, to get it right. And that stuff is hard. And that stuff is about playing mind games with yourself and tricking yourself into being in the right mood and right frame of mind and feeling right. And if actors have to be a little kind of eccentric or needy, in order to get there, then that's what they have to do, and everyone needs to respect that. There's a limit, and you know, if actors who work with me will come up against that limit, and I'll tell them to stop being so difficult. I had a terrible experience with Christopher Walken, I don't mind saying his name. <laughs> yes, Chris, you, um, who was impossible, utterly impossible for six weeks. Um, every day, all day long, was just a thorn in my side. It was what a pain in the ass. But um, unfortunately for me, he turned out to be brilliant in the film. And I, you know, what could I do but just say thank you because you made my film look good and you made me look good because he's brilliant. Others are just so delightful. Julie Waters, I constantly wanted to say, look, you don't have to be so easy on me, you know? You don't have to be so lovely. You know, you can be a bit more difficult if you like, because she's just so adorable and so eager to please and so on it and so great. Um, but every single actor I've ever worked with has been different. And on Calendar Girls, you know, it was a real kind of um, almost like textbook example of that I did hundreds of scenes with Julie Walters and Helen Mirren, who could not be more diff different as actors more wildly different and the, with Julie it's a case of bringing something and then refining it slowly and kind of by take three she's kind of perfect and then she'll stay that way for as long as you'd like and it's just all precision and Helen it's like kind of setting a bird loose in a room you know what I mean? It's like flying everywhere and flapping. There are feathers everywhere. But somehow out of that, there are moments of great genius and that you can pick out and find. Um, so um, you develop different skills and techniques to deal with. You know, you've got an actor, two actors in the scene that are wildly different in terms of the way they approach it. So, you know, you kind of have to work out, well, how am I going to manage this? Because what works for her is the opposite of what works for her, and yet they're both in the same scene. So you kind of, you have to constantly adjust and think about all that stuff. As I've gone on, I end up saying less and doing less with actors. I think I over-directed them at first. You kind of feel like you need to give it all to them, tell them what it's about, kind of tell them what to do. Um, and I kind of learned to hold back I think that's been quite important for me is let them give you something because what they're going to give you might be better than what you had in mind and often is and that's why you cast them and that's why they're great anyone can walk on set and direct a film even if they never don't know anything about it at all it looks hard but actually if you're the right kind of person you can just walk in and do it what you need to know is what story you want to tell. And if you've got a really great idea of what that story is and how you want to tell it, the rest you can find out. And the rest you have experienced people around you to help you. And you just say, I kind of feel like it should be kind of like this. And they go, well, what about doing it this way then? And you know, so there's a lot of technical stuff, but actually you can get away without knowing very much. Everybody on a film set has a slightly different idea of what it is you're doing. And it's usually kind of lent towards their particular craft. So the wardrobe people think it's all about the look and the costumes and the characters. The camera man thinks it's all about the photography, you know. And they'll all have a slightly different angle on it. And you're the guy who's coming from the point of view of the audience. Everybody else is worrying about their bit. 
but you're imagining watching this film and, and whether it's going to work and you're the only guy who's doing that and um, it's really important to grasp that, that you're not there to work out cool ways of shooting this although that's fine if you can do that as well you're there to make sure everybody's telling the same story. I was watching a little documentary thing about the making of Batman. There's Christopher Nolan. He's got these kind of thing, rigs, and he's got this gear everywhere and equipment. He's being very particular about it. And I always think, oh, I'd, I'd like to do a bit more like that, you know, very technical stuff. But ultimately, when you get down to it, none of that matters, really. One of my favourite films is Festum, um, which was shot on not even digital video cameras, analogue video cameras. Um, it was a, um, what do you call it, a, um, what's the Scandinavian thing? Oh, Dogma. Dogma, thank you, it was a Dogma film. So there was no lighting, um, no props, uh, an analogue video camera. It's a great fucking film, it's really brilliant. It hooks you in and won't let you go. And, um, because of the cast? Well, because yeah. it's because it's a great story and it's beautifully told, you know, and it's surprising and shocking and funny and powerful. And um, if on top of all that you can do some really cool shots, great. But it's no good unless you've got all that stuff. And it's no good unless it's a great story, beautifully told, perfectly acted, um, with wonderful surprises that's kind of heartbreaking and funny and moving all at the same time. You know, after that, but no amount of being clever technically is going to get you there. That's all about the story and the script. The difference, I think, now, and what the way I got started and, and you know, what happened to me, I think is huge. Mm. Because in my 20s, after I left university, it was really hard to shoot anything. You know, to be allowed a camera and stock and processing and a proper edit suite, you know, I didn't know anyone who had any of that stuff and I didn't have any money and I didn't know how to get it together and people kept telling me, oh, you should do a short, make a short, you know. And I kept going, well, how am I supposed to do that? You know, I don't have a camera, I don't have any film stock. And I think if I'd been a bit more entrepreneurial, I could have got it together, but it was hard and expensive and now of course you know with all these cameras and apple mac and everything you know any fool can make a film and um you know you can do it for 50 quid never mind five thousand um so i think you know these days that kind of apprenticeship that i had of doing lots of different jobs and doing kind of lots of different kinds of directing um almost isn't necessary you kind of almost just go make a film and, you know, if it's any good, you're off. Thank you very much for talking to me today. My pleasure. Um, right, can you leave our office now, please? <laughs> <laughs>